All right, everybody, welcome to uh, this presentation. Uh, almost kind of a lab, but uh, we're not going to be setting up Security Onion, although I'll be going through some of the steps. But uh, this, this presentation will basically be about me, how I will use Security Onion as a way to generate alerts on PCAPs of malicious network traffic. And I've got the link up here. It's where the, uh, it's got the three PCAPs that we're going to be using today. They're, uh, they're in zip, password protected zip archives. The password is infected. And there's also a, a PDF file that has the PowerPoint slides that I'm going through right now. So for this hour, we'll look uh, at uh, a lab environment uh, PCAPs and Security Onion, how I review PCAPs using Security Onion, a little bit of the way that I set it up, and three examples of malicious traffic and how Security Onion can shed some light on exactly what's going on uh, through the use of alerts and what have you. So this is a really simplified diagram of a uh, real world environment where you've got clients and you've got servers and they're talking through each other to each other through uh, switches and routers, most likely before you get to the firewall, which is uh, routed to the internet. And then usually before the firewall, you have a security appliance that is uh, detecting anything malicious that's going on in the network. And uh, depending on the type of appliance, it could be uh, just monitoring, or it could be some sort of intrusion protection uh, uh, system. Um, so uh, I talk about Security Onion because Security Onion is free. People have asked me why I don't talk about uh, my employer's uh, uh, security systems. And those are really for an enterprise environment, and it costs money. So uh, um, my uh, mandate as uh, um, part of Unit 42 of Palo Alto Networks is to uh, help inform the community and uh, just in overall just better prepare people to be able to, um, in my case, to help people be able to understand malicious network traffic. So for a lab environment, a physical lab setup that I have at home looks a little bit like this. If I were going to blow, uh, uh, draw a flow chart, I've got uh, Windows clients. I'll set up a domain controller. I'll set up a client. And then that will feed into a switch that's monitored by it, uh, what I have as a gate computer, which is recording the traffic. And then it goes out uh, and is routed through the internet. And when I have this set up, I'm using intentionally vulnerable machines and no protection whatsoever because I want a full infection chain of events. Right? I want to see, uh, you know, from the very beginning of the infection to anything that could possibly happen uh, on that infected Windows host. Now, what happens in the real world when we're out there? Anybody who's uh, uh, responsible for near real-time detection of malicious activity in their network, you're going to see bits and pieces of these things. Almost always, I've never seen in a real-world environment a full infection chain. Usually somebody uh, takes their uh, work-based laptop home, they get infected, they come back, and uh, you start seeing the post-infection callback traffic. Or if you get an alert at work, it, uh, it gets stopped by your protective uh, mechanisms in place. So you may see, say, like an exploit kit landing page, and that's it. Everything gets cut off. Or you may see an attempted download of malware, but it gets blocked. So you don't see a full infection chain. But uh, in my lab environment, when I want to see this stuff, I'm curious. I want to see what would a full infection chain look like. Because normally the places that we work at, we're not going to see that. It uh, generally is uh, unprotected home networks or the types of uh, companies and organizations that do not uh, uh, take uh, security as seriously as they should. So this is a representation of physical setup. And um, here's a representation of virtual environment. Now, you notice I don't have Security Onion in there. Uh, Security Onion is kind of, uh, uh, what's the right word for it, uh, resource intensive. Um, the minimum uh, uh, RAM recommendation is 8 gigs of RAM. 
for uh, for a Security Onion VM. So uh, if you've got uh, any of the, for example, like a MacBook up until uh, just this uh, most recent model, 16 gigs was the max amount of RAM that you could have. So it'd be kind of hard to set up a Windows client and a Windows server and uh, Security Onion to monitor the whole thing as it's going on, as it's happening. So what I will do is I will use Security Onion to play back the PCAP and see what would have happened. And that's what this next section is about. I'm going to look at uh, how I use Security Onion to uh, uh, play back and review PCAPs uh, that I've recorded in these lab type environments. So the first thing you have to do uh, for Security Onion is you go to securityonion.net. There's a downloads tab. It takes you to a uh, GitHub page where you can download an ISO. And then you can boot the ISO on a physical host or a VM. And then you install Security Onion 1604 by clicking the icon on the desktop. And once again, you go to securityonion.net. Go to the Downloads tab. Takes you to the GitHub page. The GitHub page, uh, you can download the ISO. You boot the ISO on a uh, physical or a virtual host. And uh, as you boot it, it will go to a desktop, and then you would install Security Onion. When you install Security Onion, it'll take a little while. And once you get done, the first desktop that you'll see, you'll, uh, uh, you'll have to configure your system. So you please double click on the setup icon, as it says. And you will need to configure network interfaces. Now what I'll do is uh, I'll use DHCP uh, because uh, I'm using a standalone advice, uh, device uh, for Security Onion and uh, I'm not using it in a production type environment so I don't have a, a static address that I need. I'll just take whatever address DHCP will have because it's irrelevant to what I'm using Security Onion for. Now notice where it says ENS 33, which is the, uh, with more recent versions of uh, Ubuntu, which is what Security Onion is based on, the, the distro, it, uh, instead of uh, EN0 or EN1, it's, uh, you, you'll generally get some sort of a different type of name for the, uh, for the interface, for the network interface. You'll set it up. And uh, uh, you only have one interface, generally, because you, I'm using it as a standalone device. And I'll reboot. And once I reboot, I have to go back into setting it up again. And uh, I'll have to, I'll skip the uh, network configuration because I've already configured it. Now, there are a lot of steps to, uh, to doing this. It's, it's pretty clear, it's pretty straightforward when you're setting up Security Onion, which is one of the reasons when I discovered it back in uh, 2013 that I really liked it because I tried to set up a uh, snort based on, uh, I think it was FreeBSD at the time, and I failed miserably at it. Uh, but Security Onion was the uh, uh, first time that there was a distro. I was like, hey, you just follow the instructions and boom, you're good to go. So there's the, uh, in this one, <laughs> the uh, VM that I used as I was setting it up specifically for this presentation, I just used four gigs of RAM. Well, once again, I'm not using it in a production system. I'm not using it uh, uh, for a full near real-time monitoring. I'm using it just to play back PCAPs and uh, see what types of alerts I can generate on them. And uh, I am going to use, they'll have an evaluation mode. I'll use production mode. do the uh, new setup, and instead of best practices, which is what you think you should use, uh, I'm going to go custom because I want to, uh, uh, I'll explain it here in just a little bit. With best practices, you don't get to pick um, the signature set that you're going to use and the, uh, um, the IDS engine. So you've got different uh, signature sets. I want to say that it uses, it defaults to the Emerging Threats Open Rule Set and uh, it will uh, use snort. 
but um, as the IDS, but Suricato is also an option for the IDS. Uh, what, uh, what I suggest to people is that you can use the Snort subscriber rule set. The subscription itself costs like 30 bucks a month, but you don't have to subscribe. You can just register and get uh, um, rules that are only 30 days out of date. And this one, this third one here, with the Snort Subscriber Talos rule set and Emerging Threats No GPL rule set is, um, is uh, the one where you will get both uh, rule sets that will come in at the same time. Now you'll notice when you do that, it will ask you for your Snort uh, Subscriber Talos OINT code. So in this case, I want to go to snort.org, sign in. When you sign in, there's a little area where you can sign up. And I'm going to use my email in this case. I've already done this. But uh, you know, make a, use your email, make a password, uh, agree, to the, agree to the conditions. And then there, you will have your profile. And you can go to your profile and then click where it says OINT code. And you'll have your OINT code your own personal OINT code. And you can use that, copy and paste that into the Security Onion for your OINT code. So you can get the registered uh, rule set from Talos, which is the snort-based rules that they have, as opposed to the emerging threats rules, which uh, in this case, we're using the open rule set, which is free as well. And I'm just going to leave it on snort, although you could do Suricata as well. Um, in my personal home lab, I'll tend to use just um, the, I've got access to the Emerging Threats Pro rule set. To use that, I don't have the uh, option to combine it uh, easily, at least using this setup with the Snort rule set. So uh, because I have access to the ET Pro rule set, I will uh, use the ET Pro or Suricata. A couple of other things as you're setting it up. Yes, you want to enable the IDS engine so you can actually see the alerts on the traffic when you're playing back the PCAPs. And that's, uh, and that's pretty much it. Everything else when you're setting it up, you should be able to use the default value or whatever it has. And then once you get done, we can start Squill which is a graphical interface that, uh, that shows uh, the alerts. There are other ways that you can look at it on Security Onion. Squill is the one that I tend to use that I uh, uh, refer to. When I set up the account, when I do the setup, I use the uh, easiest possible username and password, which is uh, the username is A and the password is six A's, which is as simple as I could get it. And in this case, once again, uh, um, we've got uh, OSSEC, the, the name of this uh, virtual machine is uh, SO user VM. And you'll notice that the ENS33 here, which is the interface uh, that I'm going to be using uh, um, to monitor. So when I uh, use TCP replay to replay the PCAPs in Security Onion, I'm going to use ENS33. And then there's Squill right there. It's opened up. It doesn't have anything in it. I'm going to minimize that for a minute. And at this point, I've got my three PCAPs uh, um, that we'll use today that are available on the website or on the USB keys here. And uh, if you're using a Windows laptop, there is malware in these PCAPs, and especially if you're using Windows 10. Windows 10 would uh, tend to delete those PCAPs because it detects malware. Now I want a terminal so I can uh, 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 do the command line uh, commands to do the TCP replay command. So you can basically just uh, right click in the background and open terminal. When you open a terminal, uh, this is the command that you would use uh, in this case to play back that first example of the PCAP. sudo TCP replay dash dash INTF1 equals ENS33, and then the name of the PCAP. Now, the only problem uh, when you do this uh, is that PCAP uh, is traffic that takes place over the space of about two hours. So if I'm going to play this back, 
I'll have to wait two hours to see all the alerts on this. So you can use a speed multiplier, and I'll generally use uh, uh, 30 in this case. So 30, you know, divide two hours by 30, and you've got um, what? 160 divided by 30. I don't know. It's a it's a few minutes as opposed to two hours that you'll have to wait. So this is the command that I used when I was generating alerts for this presentation. So we've got everything set up and we know the command to use and we have three PCAPs that we can look at right now. So let's take a look. Three examples of malicious traffic once again at malware-traffic-analysis.net slash 2019 slash b-sides IA. I forgot to capitalize the S and B sides. So I don't know, in some cases, the capitalization is important. Um, so we have those three PCAPs. And they are all set up in an Active Directory environment. So this Active Directory environment, the domain is papasunlight.com, where uh, the network segment is 10.4.17. The domain controller is on dot four papa sunlight dash DC. And then uh, you see your segment gateway in the broadcast address. We basically have our network segment here for this active directory environment that we're going to see three examples of uh, Windows malware infection traffic. So I use that TCP replay command and I get a bunch of stuff. I get a bunch of alerts. You know, you'll notice on the left-hand side, uh, you have red and you have orange. And orange, of course, are not as serious, uh, apparently, as red alerts. And every once in a while, I'll see a yellow, uh, which usually is uh, uh, usually some sort of protocol-based thing or, or very, very informational. It's not an alert. It just kind of gives you a little more context on what's going on, the, on for the traffic. I will say in this one, I, did, I didn't see anything that was uh, uh, on the Snort Talus Register rule set that uh, that showed up. So I don't know if it was um, how um, how I'd set it up or uh, if I just wasn't receiving. I don't know why I wasn't receiving anything on the Snort Talus rule set, but I was receiving plenty on the Emerging Threats Open rule set. Now, one of the uh, alerts I want to point your uh, attention to is where it says ET policy DNS update from external source. But if you look, both of the IP addresses, this DNS was coming from within the network. So there's obviously some sort of misconfiguration here. So I actually had to go into the snort.conf uh, uh, file, the snort configuration file, and where I found that the external net showed up as any IP address, which would be any of the internal IP addresses. I don't know why that happened. Uh, so I basically had to change that um, in the snort configuration file to show that external net is not home net. Suricata has their configuration file in the same directory. And it was the same thing with Suricata as well. It, uh, they had commented out the line that shows the external net is uh, not home net and said it was any. So I had basically had to switch that. So, uh, um, it, and I found this consistently when I was going through Security Onion setting it up, this uh, the same issue where it uh, showed external net as anything and which also included whatever my home net variable was. So that was one thing I had to fix right away. But uh, the interesting thing in this one is I could ID the infection based on one of the alerts, which I have highlighted here, the second from the bottom, which is Iced ID, which is an information stealer, also known as BachBot. And the great thing about Security Onion is I could go to that alert, I can highlight it, and I can look at the, um, the alert itself, what are the parameters? Uh, what's the uh, PCRE, uh, uh, the pro-compatible re uh, regular expression that was used uh, to catch this particular malicious traffic? And I could also see the actual TCP stream 
of what the traffic was that triggered it. Plus, for a security onion, if you've got uh, the, the options for bro turned on, now what's bro called now? Because didn't they rename it? Zeke. So it's still, it's still called bro in uh, this version, but uh, Zeke, um, there's an extracted directory where it will automatically extract any Windows executable files or DLL files that it finds in the PCAP. As, uh, as we're playing it back, it extracted it out. Now, if there are other things in this case, there's also a Word document, a Word document with macros that kicked off the infection chain that was downloaded. It was the initial thing that kicked off the infection chain. That's not going to show up in here. So if I want to see... Uh, um, to be able to use Wireshark to look at the uh, PCAP and find the uh, both the malicious uh, Windows executable file and uh, um, the malicious Word document, I can export HTTP objects from that PCAP in Wireshark. And in this case, I've got uh, two objects that I can uh, export. One says letter underscore T j83 dot doc and that's the word document with a macro you enable the macro and then it uh, immediately calls to uh, teamfocus.com.pl the url there which returns a windows executable file which is iced id so that's example one a another thing which wasn't apparently clear to me when i started uh, uh fiddling around with security and it was how in the heck do i clear the alerts Right? All these alerts were piling up, and I didn't know how to get rid of them. It's like, well, you just select them and then hit F3, and F3 will delete the alerts. F9 will escalate the alerts and put it in the escalated tab. Now, um, the, and I'll get to the reason why you'd want to escalate them here in a minute. Let's look at our second PCAP. Now, our second PCAP, we're doing the same type of command. And uh, we're seeing far little. In this case, uh, we only see we only see uh, uh, basically uh, Windows executable being downloaded. So we don't see anything else. Now the interesting thing here is you'll notice in the uh, in the count section that that CNT column. All right, the CNT column shows five events for that uh, uh, DNS uh, update from external net, uh, but 34 events for each of those other alerts. So they're grouped by source IP. So if it's triggering on traffic coming back from that public IP address, that, that server, then you know that all of the alerts that are triggering on that traffic came from that one server. But if your source IP is your internal IP address, and it's going to an external server. It's triggering on like a, a get request to uh, some public server. Then, and you have 34 alerts, it only shows the very first information, right? It's only going to show that uh, TCP and uh, TCP, uh, the, the IP address and TCP port pair. So if you escalate those, if I were to click, on this second or third or any of those lines and hit F9 to escalate them instead of F3 to, uh, to delete them, it will, I'll have a list of 34 alerts. If I do everything there, I would have, um, you know, 70 something alerts. Well, let's get back to the, this particular matter at hand. So there is an infection on this computer. I can guarantee you that. I know because I infected it. But uh, all I'm seeing here is that there are policy alerts and uh, um, the fact that there was a Windows executable downloaded from 183.177.238.19. So what else is on here? Well, you could... Uh, you could explore the PCAP, but in this case, there is email traffic, right? There's email traffic coming from this Windows client, SMTP traffic. If you filter on SMTP for this particular PCAP, you'll see plenty of, uh, plenty of information there. And if you uh, follow the TCP stream, so basically left click to select 
any of the frames that are listed there and then right click to bring up a menu, follow TCP stream, you will see the SMTP traffic that has an email that is exfiltrating information about this infected Windows host. This is a key logger. And you can tell where it's being sent to. The subject line is constants.newman slash Newman PC keystrokes, which is a clue right there that this is uh, something a little shady going on. And if we filter, in this case, on smtp.data.fragment, that should show us how many times an email was sent out within the, the, the recording time of this PCAP. And uh, uh, what, what I found out was it didn't send in anything periodically. It was only when you typed. So uh, you can see I went uh, about 22 minutes going, hmm, I'm not seeing anything else come up. Uh, maybe I'll just uh, start, you know, typing up documents and saving them and doing stuff. And once I did that, then I, st you know, I started, I got three in a row really quickly. So it's sending that stuff out there. So I want to say this is a Hawkeye keylogger, but uh, whatever it is, it's, it's an info stealer. It's a keylogger. And you'll notice that with this open rule set, the stuff that's freely available, I did not have anything to tell me within Security Onion that there was anything wrong other than that initial executable, which was more of an informational alert. So look at the third PCAP. And we do have some interesting things here. Um, so, and this is another case where the paid rule set definitely gives you more additional insight than the free rule set. All right, so uh, the Emerging Threats has a pro rule set from what I understand. Last time I remember hearing about it, it was like 750 bucks per year per sensor. Right, so if you're if you're a uh, uh, if you're an enterprise, you got sensors all over the place. You're you're you know that's a that's a, a good bit of money. If you're a, uh, a single person like me, uh, uh, not I'm married, but a an individual like myself, who uh, I, you know 750 bucks a year, that's not something I'm going to pay. I, I'm I'm lucky in that because I do the website, the malware traffic analysis website. I was contacted by the emerging threats guys before they got bought out by Proofpoint, and uh, um, uh, it was able to work out a, a deal where I could uh, I have access to the emerging threats uh, pro rule set for uh, purposes of the blog. But what I can tell you is that uh, if you look at the alerts that are highlighted here, the ones in red, the very first one you'll see that the, it shows a Fiodo tracker, uh, command control uh, channel. Fiodo is another name for Emotet. I mean, people have heard of Emotet. Okay, so a, a few hands. Uh, Emotet, uh, Emotet is a malware that's an information stealer slash banking trojan, and it also acts as a platform to load other malware. So uh, as I'm as I'm testing samples of Emotet, uh, I can almost always uh, generate some sort of follow-up malware. In this case, the follow-up malware is TrickBot. You can't see it here, but on the last one, uh, you'll see an SSL blacklist uh, uh, as far as the uh, the the the, the um, uh, SSL TLS uh, cert certificate, where it says it's Drydex slash TrickBot. And uh, in this particular case, uh, that's all we're seeing. We're seeing uh, uh, HTTPS SSL TLS traffic on TCP ports uh, 449, 447, which is typical for a TrickBot infection. So what happened in this case is you had a JavaScript single uh, JS file. So it was, uh, it, it was a fake invoice is what it was. So you had an initial download of a zip archive. It contained uh, you know, something, that, something invoice.js. The unwitting victim on a vulnerable computer would double click that and then it reaches and then it grabs the, um, the follow-up executable. In this case, it's Emotet, the Emotet malware binary. And then you start seeing some Emotet callback traffic and then a little while later, 
you start seeing the trick bot. Now, Emotet communications are encoded or otherwise encrypted. So when it, Emotet grabs its follow-up malware, it's not grabbing it uh, uh, in the open, like we'll see at the very beginning. So you're not going to see any alerts for follow-up executables come over the net because they're all encoded as they come over the wire. So if I were to look at this uh, particular PCAP, uh, the third PCAP, using this uh, specific expression, I want to look at the HTTP requests uh, that are listed, and I want to look at uh, SSL handshake type equals one, and uh, not uh, SSDP traffic because there's some UDP stuff that comes across with uh, HTTP request. And what I will say is, um, this setup that I have here for Wireshark, the column displays, is uh, something that I, I've uh, talked about before. I do traffic analysis workshops where the whole first hour is, here's how you set up Wireshark to get a better view of uh, the traffic that's more applicable to somebody that's looking at malicious uh, uh, traffic infections. Because Wireshark is an amazing tool, but by default, it's set up to be a jack of all trades to everything to everybody, right? So it is set up to appeal to as much somebody that's trying to diagnose a network for uh, uh, connectivity issues or some, uh, some sort of network problems than it is for actually you know, having the mindset of a security person that is looking at traffic and trying to determine what happened, uh, uh, especially with a lot of web traffic. Now, one last trick that we can do is uh, we can uh, use, um, in Security Onion, we can uh, um, enable this pulled pork uh, uh, configuration file. Uh, pulled pork is the program that is used to update the rule sets for uh, Snort or, in this case, uh, uh, Snort or Suricata. So it's set up, but uh, one of the things that I figured uh, out early on is there are some rules, because I'm just playing it back and I want to see every possible thing that, uh, that is listed, I want to do enable all of the signature IDs, which is the SID here. So I'll go into that and I'll add at the very end PCRE colon alert. So I want it to actually trigger on everything uh, that shows as an alert, even if it's uh, disabled by default in that uh, uh, in the normal configuration, you'll get a lot more alerts, and uh, it, it it can be a lot of noise. So this definitely went a little quicker than I thought it would, because I have like 63 slides, and uh, definitely went through them in approximately 30 minutes. Let me do something here real quick. As we're taking questions, I'll uh, put that URL back up. So if anybody has any questions, now is the time to ask. Please. Yes, ma'am. How did I know how to do the changes in the files? Yeah. Uh, the configuration files and whatnot? Yeah. Um, it, uh, trial and error. It, I first discovered Security Onion in 2013. And uh, uh, one of the things that actually did happen is as I'm doing these blog posts and showing what I have, and, and you know, there would be certain things that would uh, be in the traffic that I wouldn't be able to show on the blog post. Uh, I'd, I'd corresponded via email with Doug Burks who is the uh, Security Onion maintainer, and he'd given me some helpful tips on uh, some of this stuff. And that's how I picked up some of it. The, uh, the, the part with the home net issue, that was just me figuring out why is this happening? I got to look into the configuration files. And they, that, uh, that was just something after a while uh, you kind of pick up on. So I mean, you really have to know in order to be able to, to do this effectively, there are three things that you got to know. You, you got to have a basic knowledge of network traffic fundamentals, right? To, to understand that UDP port, 50, uh, uh, UDP port 53, for example, is what you normally see a lot of DNS traffic on, 
All right. It, there are just certain things that uh, that you have to be used to, uh, and it requires a good familiarity with network traffic fundamentals because we're dealing with network traffic. Now, another thing uh, to use Security Onion uh, uh, to get good with that, you have to have um, a good uh, solid knowledge of uh, Linux fundamentals, right? So in order to be able to, um, you know, just uh, open up a, a text editor, you know, it, uh, knowing to, that you have to use sudo to, uh, to, uh, um, to VI a system file, you know, that's owned by root, uh, you know, certain things that uh, you have to be able to do that, uh, uh, that implies that you, you've got to know a good solid Linux uh, uh, fundamentals. You. Oh, you're welcome. Yes, sir. Yes. Um, is there, do you have something online like a blog post or a video where you go over your... I do. I don't have a video. The question was uh, um, that I'd mentioned how I have uh, uh, preferred uh, setup for Wireshark for the column display. Um, on the uh, malwaretrafficanalysis.net blog, I've got an older one that I did, and I recently did one uh, at the last half of last year for uh, Palo Alto Networks for the blog. If you were to look, uh, Wireshark configuration, Duncan, and then maybe Palo Alto Networks, uh, to Google that, you should be able to find that one uh, pretty quickly. Uh, right now, at this point in time, I've done uh, three blogs that are tutorials on Wireshark for Palo Alto Networks, uh, for the Unit 42 blog. So I've got uh, the one for setting up Wireshark, I've got one for identifying hosts and users, and I've got one for using Wireshark filters. Awesome. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, sir. How often do you see the initial download? Good question. The question is, how often do I see that initial download? Uh, um, and <laughs> the um, well, now I could say. So I've been working at Palo Alto Networks as a researcher, not as uh, for you know, any sort of customer support, just uh, straight research. So I don't have, uh, prior to that, I was uh, working at Rackspace, at a socket Rackspace uh, hosting provider, right? So I would have some indications, you know, there on the stuff coming in, but what I'm doing, a lot of these malware samples I'm getting from uh, virus total, uh, URL Haas, uh, other things that people are reporting. And these are stuff that generally get caught by, um, they're usually mal spam based, so malicious spam that generally gets caught by the your organization's spam filters. So a lot of this stuff isn't even seen. Now every once in a while you'll see something because it's like a um, uh, uh, it's like a, a, a fire hose. The criminals are using a fire hose and just spraying out whatever they can, right? And every once in a while, an email will get through for one reason or another. It's a kind of a cat and mouse game, right? They're, they're constantly tweaking their emails, just trying to get that, that, uh, uh, that initial uh, Word document or you know, whatever to get somebody to double click. Uh, so it's rare. And then like I had mentioned earlier, uh, um, a lot of times if you've got, uh, so you, if you have decent spam filters in place, if you've got a good uh, uh, firewall and web uh, security gateway filtering type stuff, um, it, it's, you're not going to see a full infection chain. But uh, so the answer to this stuff, this is all commodity malware, which is uh, out there every day as the criminals are just trying to push it out, fire hose like fashion to get that 1% worldwide that makes it somehow profitable for them. So uh, realistically, we don't see that much. Now what I find, what I've found in, uh, in my personal experience with a few crews that I've worked with is that the better your uh, um, security systems are, your security architecture is, the less experience that the, the people that are looking for the bad activity will have because you don't see it. You start getting complacent. So it's kind of a rambling answer to your question, but uh, uh, I rarely see this stuff in a decently protected enterprise environment, if at all. But 
these are the same tactics that uh, uh, you know targeted attacks uh, will use, right? So I mean, you may not see these particular examples, but uh, some of the stuff that we run into, hopefully, as I'm uh, providing these PCAPs to my blog, are the types of traffic that you might see if your organization is, uh, you know, the the target of a successful attack. You'll see some of this stuff. Any other questions? Well, if not, uh, oh, sir, yes. Do I have a preferred uh, a preferred OS for my infected uh, lab host? Uh, Windows 7 right now. Windows 7, 64-bit, uh, uh, service pack one or whatever. Um, it, it definitely is much, much easier to infect a Windows 7 host than a Windows 10 host. So say what you will about Windows 10 as far as usability, uh, uh, you know, spyware callback uh, type stuff, all the other complaints that uh, people have about Windows 10. Windows 10 is a much, much, much more secure operating system than Windows 7 is. Uh, but they are still, uh, um, they are still close enough that uh, uh, a Windows 7 host could get infected. Uh, um, you know, it, it will uh, file and directory structure and uh, some of the things that you will see um, artifacts from an actual infection. It, um, you would see them in the same places on Windows 10 hosts. But yeah, it's a it's a real pain to actually get a Windows 10 host set up to where you're disabling as much as you can uh, in an almost unnatural manner in order to get it infected. So uh, for Windows 7 default settings, for Windows 10, I, I would have to basically turn off the firewall uh, 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 and make sure and turn off uh, any of the levels of protection. And, and even then, there's uh, probably some registry tweaks that I could do to ensure that certain things are also not going on that make it even easier to kind of set it up to where I can infect a Windows 10 host like I could a Windows 7 uh, host set up default. Any other questions? Well, if not, then thank you very much for uh, coming to my presentation.